sound could almost be the sermon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have something to learn from our elders. If we refuse to listen, the consequences can be grim. On this All Saints Day, we are especially mindful of those who have come before us, how they have taught us and shaped us and loved us. In 1861, when Fort Sumter fell in South Carolina, this country was deeply divided. This was the beginning of a bloody, protracted civil war between North and South, the Union Confederacy. A total of 620,000 uh, soldiers fell during the Civil War, the course of that war. Uh, half of all deaths in all wars, approximately, since the United States has existed. Um, ostensibly a war about the right of southern states to secede, it eventually became a war about slavery, and about whether or not we could see people whose skin color is different as equal. And many of the issues we continue to deal with to this day, whether it be racism or inequality in our country, stem from this original sin of slavery and racism in our country. When my family and I toured Gettysburg, Gettysburg in uh, 2013, there was, a, there was a new museum there, a visitor center. I had been there about eight years earlier, and I frankly didn't recognize the place. It looked so different because it was the sesquicentennial, the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, which is often called by historians the high watermark it was the point in the war where the Confederacy got farther north than it had gone ever. And it was probably the weakest moment for the Union. Um, now, interestingly, for those of us ELCA Lutherans, we have a seminary at Gettysburg where the battle was fought. It was the buildings were used for strategy, and if you go and visit, you can see uh, bullet marks in the walls. My colleagues who are pastors that really like the Civil War tended to go to Gettysburg for seminary. <laughs> What I noticed there, in addition to the information about military history and the kind of guns they use and uniforms in daily life, all kinds of facts that have medicine, um, was uh, uh, an exhibit that displayed the number of troops furnished from each state. Um, and what really surprised me is that there were troops furnished for the Union, for the North, from the South, from Southern states. From Confederates, declared Confederate states. We would expect this maybe from border states like Kentucky and Maryland or, and uh, Missouri were slave owning states that fought for the Union. Missouri had about 100,000. Um, states like uh, Tennessee, though, Tennessee and West Virginia each had about 31,000 that fought for the Union. And those were, those were southern states or southern territories. Alabama had 2,500. Union soldiers, North Carolina, 3,156. Texas had just under 2,000. Uh, there was one state, though, that had no Union recruits, and it was the state of Virginia. Nobody in Virginia fought for the Union, and that may be because uh, Robert E. Lee was from Virginia, and of course couldn't, couldn't not fight for his home state, even though he was a great general for the United States. Well, this was, what, what this impressed on me was the deep division within our country, within our states, probably within communities, among families, neighbors, and even in some cases, brother versus brother. I've heard that before, I wasn't sure what to think about it, but it actually is true. There was a family of actors in Maryland named Booth, and one son, Edwin, was a unionist. He believed in the cause of the North, abolishing slavery, and there was another son, his brother, named John Wilkes Booth, who, as we probably know if we've studied history at all, ended the life of our 16th president with a bullet in the back of his head. So much did he believe in the cause of the Confederate states and the right of states to secede from what they thought. So this was a, a time of 
division and disunity in our national history that stays with us. Now, you may know something of division within your own family stories. I do. My mom's family is from Nebraska, and my dad's family is from Oklahoma. We have an artifact from my mom's side of the family that clearly makes, that clearly states uh, that we had uh, people fighting for the Union during the Civil War on her side of the family. And my grandfather, dearly beloved grandfather, whom I knew and grew up with and loved, his name was Robert Edward Lee Smith, Jr. <laughs> so there was Robert Edward Lee Smith, Sr. as well. Uh, clearly, uh, different sides within our family. Abraham Lincoln said in 1858, a house divided cannot stand. He was sp speaking to Republican colleagues in Illinois, um, fellow Republican uh, uh, politicians. It was a famous speech that brought him a lot of notoriety and made him a lot of enemies, in addition to launching his political career and sending him eventually to the White House. He was quoting Jesus, interestingly. Those are the words of Jesus. But wise. We studied in our narrative lectionary uh, different periods in the history of Israel. We talked a little bit about the period of the judges, where uh, God's people and their land were judged and ruled uh, by, by judges that adjudicated cases individually. And that the people wanted a king, they wanted a united monarchy, and they got that, although there's some kind of negative repercussions to that as well. And there were three kings over united Israel, as we've talked about, Saul, David, and Solomon. And Solomon was an interesting character. We didn't read anything about Solomon uh, directly, but he was the son of David. He was wealthy. He was a builder. He liked to build things. He built the temple in Jerusalem, the place where God dwelt, and many other structures as well. He also was known for having a lot of worldly wisdom. Queen Sheba famously came to him and wanted to hear what he had to say. There's a book in the Apocrypha called The Wisdom of Solomon. And he had many wives, I mean many wives, like a thousand wives, from other countries and other nations that brought with them their gods and their religion and their faith, which he was inclined to believe and follow. So it was, he had a divided heart, is what the Bible tells us. And God wasn't happy about this. Um, so Solomon's son, Rehoboam, which we heard about in the text for today, um, inherits the throne. And he has an opportunity to make things right. Really, the way Solomon built all these buildings was by enslaving his own population, laying a heavy yoke on them, and burdening them um, in, a, in a way that they, they, they couldn't forget. Rehoboam has a chance to make this right, however. Senior advisors that had known Solomon, that had seen what had gone on, advised him to have mercy and compassion for these people, to listen to them and what they had to say. Uh, but he refused. He took it, instead the advice of people he'd grown up with, young, young advisors who said, Solomon made it bad, you need to make it worse. He disciplined with whips, you should discipline with scorpions. And that's exactly what Rehoboam did. The north, all the tribes that weren't Judah, um, said, you can stuff it, Rehoboam. We're not interested. Went to their tents. They were under the leadership of a rival named Jeroboam. And that was it. The monarchy was divided. North, Israel, and south, Judah. Now this is a division uh, within the house of David as well, which is significant because God had made an eternal covenant with David. So, and, and a big problem for Israel. It would never again be united, at least not until the modern era. There is a lesson in this story for us. We should listen to our elders. They've lived, and we, our culture is terrible at this, I just want to say. Chasing after the latest gadget or innovation or whatever is new, we don't honor and value the wisdom and lived experience of those who've gone before. Certainly not well enough in my view. And as historians have taught and like to say, those who do not learn lessons from history are bound to repeat them. So we would do well to listen to our elders. This is especially timely today on All Saints Day as we remember those who've gone before 
our faithful, beloved departed, the cloud of witnesses that surround us, as the book of Hebrews says, when we gather as God's people for worship, when we gather at the altar for communion, our, our saints are with us. Not necessarily just super holy people, but those whom God has claimed and knows in baptism. <coughs> we have commemorated those who are resting in our midst at our columbarium, and we look forward and are mindful that others will also make this their final resting place. And they are with us in a real way. The other lesson for us is what Jesus said. The Gentiles were known as people that exerted their power, lording it over others, but not so among you, he says. Those who would be great must serve, and whoever wants to be first must be servant and slave of all. This one who became humble and became a servant on our behalf teaches us the path forward, the way God wants us to live in the world, to choose mercy and compassion and not cruelty and power and control. Jesus reminds us what we have learned from the saints who have come before, that there is blessedness in serving. If we choose not to, if we choose our own path, if we walk the way of power and control and are not humble and gracious, there are consequences, sometimes awful consequences. But if we serve, we will know that joy of that cloud of witnesses who have brought us to where we are, that have nurtured and loved and sustained us. 